Latin America is home to some of the most exotic locations in the world. No, this is not a travel episode. We're talking about the economy, as there has been some rising interest since the U.S. Federal Reserve finally began cutting interest rates. So what does this mean moving forward? We're going to break it all down for you right here on UBS Trending. Hi, everyone, and welcome to UBS Trending. I'm Anthony Pastore. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode. Joining me today in the studio is Pedro Quintanilla Dieck. He's a senior emerging market strategist with our chief investment office. First of all, Pedro, it's great to have you here. You know, the outlook for Latin America, from what you read and what you look at, it seems to be a little bit lackluster. Tell us what's happening in there and why that's the sentiment around Latin America right now. Thanks, Anthony. It's great to be here. And you have hit the nail on the head. It takes two to tango. And it seems like Latin America is not really taking advantage of an, an, a global environment that is relatively favorable for it. And like you said, the outlook is pretty lackluster, and we find there are three main reasons for this. Number one, as has been the case throughout Latin American history, fiscal risks are rising. Mm. Many countries in the region are really struggling to take control of their fiscal accounts, even those countries with a solid fiscal track record. And number two, the prospect for economic reforms that boost productivity remain lagging, with the exception of maybe Argentina. And number three, the region really remains susceptible to political risk. This was underscored by recent developments in Mexico, where institutions are undergoing some controversial changes, or in Panama, where the credit rating has been under pressure since the closure of one of their large copper mines late last year. So taken together, these factors are really limiting Latin America's potential. Yeah, you know, and I think just by you giving us that first answer to the question, I think it reminds our audience that there are a lot of parts to the story. There's different countries, different ways that they run their political, um, you know, structure, um, different economies. So let me unpack the first one with you, which is the, the fiscal development in the region that you were talking about. I think that's really interesting, especially given what's happening here in the United States, where the Fed is starting to cut rates finally after two years. What's that fiscal picture look like when you unpack that? That's a great question, Anthony. So for context, following the pandemic, Latin America, like the rest of the world, spent a lot of money trying to get out of the recession and as a result, had a large budget deficit. Mm. Right? Since then, many of these countries have tried to bring these fiscal deficits to more sustainable levels. For example, this year, senior policymakers in the region's largest economies are targeting fiscal deficits that range from 2 to as high as 5% of GDP, depending on the country. However, if you look at the data, as of June, the cumulative 12-month deficit is much higher than that. It's mm -hmm. actually hovering uh, between 4 to as high as 8% of GDP for some countries. Mm -hmm. This is partly because, similar to the United States, there are political and social pressures for governments to spend more money on things that we value, roads, bridges, pensions, and other types of social benefits. Right. Yeah, infrastructure obviously is a massive um, importance and also a budget spend. We've seen that here in the U.S. with the, uh, with the, the, the um, Inflation Reduction Act and everything that was part of that. And obviously that's important in Latin American countries, clearly. When you look at that list of countries, we had that really very informative chart just on the screen. Are there any specific countries that you cover that are more at risk than some of the others, especially in this scenario? Yes, the, the countries that are more at risk are the usual suspects, Brazil and Colombia, which don't have a great history of being fiscally disciplined and that are currently running pretty high fiscal deficits. Mm. That being said, even countries with a better track record, such as Chile, Peru, and Mexico, are running pretty high deficits. For example, Mexico, which had a, a history of fiscal prudence for the past few years, is running pretty, pretty high fiscal deficit, one of the highest in the past few decades. Mm. So one of the things I read in a recent report that you and the team wrote was about you talking again about that lackluster kind of performance or expectations of growth. So what does it look like when you put it all together, say the next five years or so for Latin America, when you look at the opportunities for growth there? What does that picture look like? Yes. In terms of the fiscal accounts, I do believe that most governments will be able to bring fiscal deficits to more sustainable levels mm. for two main reasons. Number one, 
we do think that fiscal authorities in the region want to really get control of their fiscal accounts because let's face it, at the end of the day, no one wants to have a reputation of living beyond one's means. And number two, we do see in several countries institutions pushing back against fiscal irresponsibility. Just yesterday, the Congress in Colombia refused to pass a bill that had a pretty overly optimistic revenue assumptions for next year. Mm. And even a few months ago in Chile, the Congress made changes to the fiscal framework to better anchor the future trajectory of public debt. Right. That being said, because of the social constraints that I mentioned, it will probably be a, a slow and grueling process. Right? And that's why bringing it all together, it seems like Latin America will likely muddle through in the next few years with a challenging fiscal and growth outlook. And indeed, if you look at the growth projection for next year, growth forecasts for the large regional economies are actually expected to settle at a slightly below pre-COVID averages, which is not great. Right. Yeah, and, and just again, charts are great representations to show us what exactly you're talking about. And in the report, you talk about fiscal dynamics being Latin America's Achilles heel. So from the investment perspective, if you're talking to someone who is interested in perhaps investing in Latin America, what does this mean for them? Is there an opportunity here or is this lackluster expectation something you would shy away from investment wise? What are your what are your thoughts there? Yeah. I think there are investment opportunities. So, like I said, it's not like we're about to enter a golden era for Latin America. Mm -hmm. But this, the situation is also not dire. And the silver lining is that in several cases, we think that the cheap valuations are too much given the country's fundamentals. They don't, they don't seem to they match don't, up. They don't seem to match completely okay. up. So, for example, in external sovereign debt, we think that the yields in countries such as Colombia, Brazil, Panama, more than compensate for the risks of investing in these countries. And currencies, we think that the Mexican peso can continue to recover if political risks subside. And despite all the challenges that the region is facing, you still have some positive idiosyncratic stories, mm. such as is the case in Argentina. So to summarize, even though uh, investing in Latin America might seem risky, in several cases, the risk might well be worth the reward. Right. What kind of percentages are we looking at, like for as far as when you're, if you're investing in a sovereign debt, sovereign bond from uh, one of the, you know, just on average, are we looking at seven, six, seven percent right now? Yeah. It depends on the country. I would right. say that for the countries that I mentioned, uh, somewhere between 5.5 and 7 percent okay. seems reasonable. Yeah. Pedro, thank you so much. It's a, it's a great rundown. And obviously, there's a, there's, a, there's a huge story happening in Latin America. And as you really helped us understand in the beginning, there are a lot of countries that make up that region. So a lot of different ways that you can look at their economic policies and their fiscal responsibility. So thanks for breaking it down for us. Great to see you. Great to be here, Anthony. Thanks yeah. for having me. Pedro Quintanilla Dieck from the Chief Investment Office. And thank you all for joining us. There's a lot more information on this topic as well as the more broader emerging markets coverage that our CIO has. You can check that out on our website, ubs.com forward slash views. Plus, you can follow UBS on social media. We're on all the major channels, including Instagram. You can follow us at UBS Trending. Lots of great studios content on that page for you. And as always, please, if you have any questions about what Pedro and I spoke about today, make sure that you are talking to your financial advisor. Until next time, I'm Anthony Pastore. We wish you a great rest of your day. And remember to keep your eyes on what's trending. We'll see you soon, everybody.